The Indonesian archipelago, long under Dutch control, whether through the Dutch East India Company or directly as a colony, found itself liberated by the Japanese in March of 1942. By war's end, three and a half years later, Indonesia felt itself ready to be an independent state. The Dutch, supported by their Western allies, had other ideas, namely that they wanted to resume their colonial control of Indonesia. The political landscape of the island chain was ripe for alliances, counter-alliances, revolution, and insurgency. I'm your host David, and today we'll be discussing the situation in Indonesia and the rise of Sukarno. This is The Cold War. The Japanese occupation of Indonesia was marked by several features consistent with Japanese policy in other territories taken during the Second World War, such as Burma or the Philippines. They actively promoted the idea that they were there as liberators from colonial rule. They also actively recruited Indonesians to serve in the army. Somewhat differently, however, they did not grant formal independence to Indonesia nor were they invited to join the Greater East Asia Conference in Tokyo in 1943. Instead, the prominent independence leaders, Sukarno and Mohamed Hatta, were invited to informal meetings held after the close of the conference. As the Japanese military situation continued to sour and become more desperate through 1944, efforts were made by Tokyo to maintain good relations with Indonesia in order to keep its support in both men and materiel. To this end, independence was promised. Of course, it's vitally important to note here that the Japanese occupation was still a brutal and oppressive regime, and there are estimates that up to 4 million Indonesians died during the occupation from both oppression and famine. Okay, so we should talk a bit about exactly who Sukarno was. At the time of the Japanese occupation, he was already a veteran politician, the leader of the Indonesian National Party, and a firm believer in the independence of Indonesia from the Dutch. He was willing to work with the Japanese in order to promote Indonesian nationalism and independence. Sukarno's leadership in the independence movement was also joined prominently by Mohamed Hatta and Ahmad Sobarjo, both veterans in the struggle against the Dutch. Sukarno is also credited as the founder of the principles of Pancasila, the official philosophy on which the Indonesian state would be founded. The five tenets of Pancasila were belief in God, humanitarianism, national unity, democracy, and social justice. He saw these as being necessary in order to govern the geographically vast and ethnically diverse chain of islands. There was a generational divide amongst those seeking independence. Sukarno and Hatta represented the older elite, who favored a more gradual transition to a free state. The younger generation, however, advocated for immediate independence. One of these younger groups even went so far as to kidnap Sukarno and Hatta and force them to declare the independence of Indonesia. On August 16, 1945, Hatta and Sobarjo, in conjunction with senior Japanese leadership in Indonesia, agreed on the draft of that declaration. The next day, August 17, Sukarno and Hatta declared the independence of Indonesia. So that's it, right? A newly independent country moves on in its own perfect harmony and nothing more ever happens? No, we're just getting started. So, August 17th, 1945. Indonesia is now independent. Well, it's declared its own independence anyway. To the Allies, Indonesia was still Dutch. Two days previously, the Japanese had surrendered to the Allies. In Indonesian territory, however, there was a lack of Allied troops and as a result, Japanese troops would remain in order to maintain order until the Allies could arrive. A constitution was approved proclaiming the principles of Pancasila and enshrining the separation of the branches of government and a presidential political system. That still reflected some features of a parliamentary system. There was originally a proposal that all Muslims in the new country would be required to adhere to Sharia law but this was removed for fear of the sectarian divisions it could create. In fact, the constitution proclaimed tolerance of religious minorities. However, this only served to create conflict with these Islamists in the country. But more on that later. Sukarno became the first president of Indonesia with Hatta as his vice president, all approved by the PKKI, the Preparatory Committee for Indonesian Independence. 
the body tasked with coordinating the transfer of power from the Japanese to an independent Indonesia. Less than two weeks later, on August 29, Sukarno dissolved the PKKI and established the KNIP, the Central Indonesian National Committee. KNIP was the new legislature, made up at first of 135 members and represented the vast geography and social makeup of Indonesia. It included women, youth, various religions, and importantly, members from outside of Java. The KNIP allowed for the legal creation of political parties and, vitally, was responsible to Parliament instead of to the President. By November, Sukarno had agreed to all of this and Sutan Siahir, a veteran nationalist organizer, became the first Prime Minister. Okay, so quick recap. Indonesia, which had been a Dutch colony before the Japanese arrived in 1942, had taken steps to become an independent nation after the surrender of the Japanese to the Allies in August 1945. However, the Western nations, including the Dutch and the British, didn't recognize that independence, despite the formation of an Indonesian government. To compound things, some Indonesians maintained loyalty to the colonial ideas, some had worked with the Japanese, and then there was a divide in the independence movement between the younger and older generation as to how quickly the pace of independence should move. Some of you out there already know where this is heading. The early part of the independence struggle is known as the Bersiap, which translates as get ready. It was a period marked by persistent violence as the youth of Indonesia set about attacking both the old feudal lords who had helped rule under the Dutch, but also those who had collaborated with the Japanese. The loyalty to the new republic of most in Java was fairly easy to command due to their proximity to the government in Jakarta. But the farther away from Java one went, the more likely it was to find Rajas, the ruling elite, who had enriched themselves at the expense of the local population, who now saw an opportunity for revenge. Pemuda, which means youth in Indonesian, was the blanket term for these youth-dominated organizations pursuing armed actions to increase their power and influence. As early as September 1945, Pemuda had taken control of infrastructure targets, such as railway stations, and even had their own radio transmitters and newspapers to carry out independent propaganda campaigns. Pemuda operated vast militias all across the country, and importantly, some of their violence was targeted towards Dutch internees, Eurasians, Chinese, and Ambonese. Leftist groups also became prominent, with the Marxist Tan Malaka being among the strongest. Malaka considered the older generation of nationalists, like Sukarno, to not be resolute enough in pursuing true independence and set about uniting the various leftist groups into one single overarching coalition. The Front, made up of approximately 140 different groups, called for both independence and the nationalization of all foreign-owned land and industry. To help push his message, Malaka organized large demonstrations. At one point, he had as many as 200,000 demonstrators gathered, and it was only the overwhelming popularity of Sukarno and Hata that were able to pacify this crowd before the Japanese troops, still nominally in charge of security, could violently suppress that crowd. Now, although the Dutch were supposed to be the colonial masters of Indonesia, the Netherlands had been critically weakened by the Second World War and were not able to put together a sufficient force to resume control of the islands. Instead, it was agreed that the British Empire would supply troops on their behalf until the Dutch were able to resume control. These British troops began arriving in late September of 1945, but as you can imagine, were not made to feel very welcome by the Republican Indonesians. It became clear to Sukarno and his government that an army would need to be formed as quickly as possible. However, as the Japanese had disarmed all the pre-existing Indonesian forces before their surrender to the Allies, any military force put together would have to be an amalgam of various independent units that had formed around charismatic leaders, as opposed to a centrally organized and controlled command structure. So, of course, this hastily assembled Indonesian army took on the British troops that had come to occupy their newly independent nation. The largest battle in the conflict took place quite early, in October of 1945, over the city of Surabaya, at the eastern end of the island of Java. The British moved into the region looking to expel the Indonesian army, 
The battle for control of the city lasted for more than three weeks, but ultimately the better armed and better disciplined British troops succeeded in taking Surabaya. But in a case of losing the battle but winning the war, the Battle of Surabaya proved to be a major rallying point for the Republicans, greatly magnifying local support for the independence of Indonesia. This rallying cry of popular support also helped convince the British that they should remain neutral during their time in the country, and even led them to withdraw support for a return of Dutch colonialism. However, the Dutch did return. It took until November of 1946 for up to 50,000 Dutch troops to arrive and relieve the British, but they did arrive. Their occupation of places like Jakarta, Sulawesi, and other regions was met with hostility and violence. With the violence escalating and international pressure mounting against both sides to do something about it, the Indonesian Republicans and Dutch representatives met and came to an agreement. What became known as the Lingajati Agreement stipulated that the Dutch recognized the Republic of Indonesia would have de facto control over Java, Sumatra, and Madura. In exchange, Sukarno and his government agreed that the Republic of Indonesia would be one of three member states in a United States of Indonesia, which would itself be under Dutch sovereignty. Confused? I know I was when I first saw the agreement. Anyway, the agreement went on to clarify that any region unwilling to enter the United States could do so, but it had to be done via the public will. It was at best a compromise, and like many compromises, it left the radicals on both sides quite unhappy. This unhappiness manifested itself when the Dutch Parliament, while ratifying the agreement, gave their own elucidation. They decided that not all of the former Dutch East Indies territory would be a part of the United States of Indonesia, and West Papua would be retained as a colony, mostly so the religious lobby in the Netherlands could continue their missionary work there. That elucidation was less about clarity and more about trying to retain power and influence. Sukarno and Hatta, for their part, had to once again rely on their own personal influence to get the agreement ratified back home. They went so far as to threaten to resign if the KNIP didn't ratify the agreement. Only that way, oh, and expanding the membership of the KNIP to 514 seats to achieve a majority, were the two statesmen able to get the agreement passed. The appointment of friendly Republicans was necessary to offset the opposition coalitions that had formed the left wing and the Republican fortress. When the agreement was finally signed in Jakarta on March 25, 1947, it was met with celebrations across Indonesia. But as you can see from the timestamp on this video, the struggle was still far from over. The Dutch quickly became unhappy with the Republicans, especially around their attempts to establish their own separate foreign relations with other countries. A series of demands were issued by the Dutch, including the halting of establishment of relations with foreign powers, a reiteration of Dutch sovereignty, the allowance of a joint police force into Indonesian territory, and the lifting of a food blockade into Dutch-controlled areas. The Indonesian rejection of these demands prompted the Dutch to respond with military force. Operation Product was designed to secure more territory from the Indonesians and thereby regain access to sugar, oil, and rubber supplies to make sure the Dutch could properly finance the 100,000 Dutch troops that had been deployed to Indonesia. The operation quickly led to the occupation of large areas of both Java and Sumatra. The Republican response was, I'm sure you've already guessed, guerrilla warfare. The Dutch response to that was a blockade and even airstrikes. The ensuing violence was such that by August 1st, 1947, an Australian call for a ceasefire was passed in the United Nations Security Council. Several weeks later, a US proposal was also passed, allowing for UN assistance in brokering a ceasefire, creating the Committee of Good Offices, made up of a representative from the Netherlands, one from Indonesia, and one from a mutually agreeable selected country, in this case, the United States. Negotiations dragged on for months, with lines of control and who could or would be able to join a Republic of Indonesia being the main sticking points. The eventual Renville Agreement was signed on January 17, 1948, using the Van Mook Line as the de facto border. The Renville Agreement allowed for a further negotiated settlement to be worked on without ongoing fighting. Okay, so a ceasefire is in place, which means that the violence is over, right? Nope, 
It's just that the violence was now less directed at the Dutch, and now more focused internally, between various Indonesian political groups, as they fought for control of the Republic of Indonesia. One of the most significant of these groups was the Democratic People's Front, the FDR. This was a coalition of several leftist groups, including the Communist Party of Indonesia and the Socialist Party. They did not want any negotiation with the Dutch, and even called for the nationalization of all Dutch assets in Indonesia. It was strongly supported in the labor movements, as you would expect, but also in the armed forces. This of course came to a head when Vice President Hatta decided to relaunch his rationalization reforms, which included reducing the size of the armed forces to approximately 57,000 men. Hatta wanted these men to return to the workforce to help boost production and the economic strength of the nation. I'm sure it was just a coincidence that this would have also weakened the power of the FDR while also making the army less of a threat in Indonesian politics. The reforms had only limited success, as many of the disbanded troops either expressed their loyalty to the FDR or just joined them outright. Ongoing strikes through 1947 and 1948 increased, demanding agrarian reforms and better living and working conditions for all workers. So a clearly tense situation exists between the Republicans and the leftists. So what happens next? The government of Jakarta rejects a consular agreement with the Soviet Union and starts to tie itself into the American orbit. At the same time, a propaganda tour through the nascent country by an old communist leader, Musso, gave courage and support to the FDR. The result, of course, was an outbreak of fighting between government forces and pro-FDR forces. The government response was to trigger a purge in the army of any leftists remaining. The FDR, led by Musso, withdrew into East Java, centered on the town of Madiun, and, according to Sukarno, declared a Soviet state there. Musso responded with a declaration of war, despite opposition to this move within his own ranks. Jakarta responded with military action, and by the end of October of 1948, the leadership of the FDR had been killed, along with up to 24,000 people. Okay, so clearly from this, we can see that Sukarno and Hatta have no love for communism. The United States clearly recognized this, and appreciated this. Thus, when the Dutch relaunched offensive operations against the Indonesians, the United States stepped in to help. Help the Indonesians, that is. The Dutch Operation Crow resulted in the capture and control of much of Java and Sumatra, and included the Indonesian government leadership. The United States, seeing an ally potentially vanish, threatened the Dutch with a cessation of financial aid. Remember the Marshall Plan? The US intervention led to the Dutch withdrawing their claims to Indonesia, and full sovereignty was granted to Indonesia by December of 1949. A new, fully independent state that was firmly pro-American was established, a vital gain for the United States as the Cold War deepened. However, the struggle for Indonesian independence had cost over 100,000 lives and had created deep divisions in the new country. These divisions would quickly assert themselves, and decades of further struggle and fighting were yet to come, all of which we will discuss in upcoming episodes. We hope you've enjoyed today's topic, and to make sure you don't miss any future episodes, please make sure that you're subscribed to our channel and press the bell button. We can be reached via email at thecoldwarchannel at gmail.com or on Facebook at www.facebook.com slash thecoldwartv. We rely on our patrons to create these videos, so consider supporting us via www.patreon.com slash thecoldwar. This is The Cold War Channel, and don't forget, the trouble with the Cold War is that it doesn't take too long before it becomes heated.